going to do a real quick video here on New Bible Version Insanity, and I'm going to tell you why I, as a New Version user for 25 years, uh, became King James Bible believing. All right. The reason why is because I realized that standing for the New Versions and the philosophy that underlies them actually leads you to insanity. All right. Um, let me show you. Let me demonstrate. Here's how we start out when you start to talk to a New Version person which I dealt with in the past because I was one. Number one, the King James Version cannot be God's perfect word because it is just a translation. Okay? That leads you into number two. No translation can be inspired. See? So let's say, you know, the King James wasn't the Bible that was there in the first century. You know, no translation can be inspired. Uh, and then they ignore the whole bunch of places in Scripture where it would have been translated in the original. Where you have in the book of Acts where Paul is speaking in Hebrew and yet it's translated into Greek. In the original. Just ignore that. But this leads you to number three. Only the original languages are reliable and definitive. So you have to go and you have to pick up a copy of the Nestles. If you want to go with the uh, Alexandrian style or with the... Uh, Textus Receptus, if you want to go with the Syrian type. Which leads you to, number four, all manuscripts have copyist errors and, are mo and most are incomplete. Look at some of the old papyrus fragments, the oldest, they're generally the oldest uh, manuscript evidence out there. Um, most of them are just a little tiny piece of paper or something like this. So, and then there are differences and variations and readings and all, you know, all this different stuff. So it's incomplete. These manuscripts that we have, because see, these are not manuscripts. These are texts. These are prepared from manuscripts. Understand the difference. Number five, this leads you to number five. Only the original autographs were perfect and inspired by God. Yeah, that's what they believe. That's where you'll have to go to if you stand for the new versions. Okay, number six, the autographs never existed in a complete volume. Absolutely true. The original autographs of Genesis were not around when the original autographs of Revelation were written. So there was never a time when a whole Bible in a perfect, originally inspired form existed on the earth. So why make that the final authority? You're making something the final authority that never even existed. But when you get to that level of insanity, you go to the next one. Number seven, God's perfect word only exists in heaven. They'll go to that one. God raptured up each one of the original autographs when they made copies of it. He raptured it up to heaven. And they'll actually quote scripture, the verse that talks about God's word being settled in heaven. And they'll quote, verses of Scripture to prove that Scriptures today are not inspired. See, it's insanity. Number eight, since God's Word, number seven here, since God's Word exists only in its perfect form in heaven, number eight, God reveals truth from heaven to men in different ways, but no one can claim to have absolute truth. That's why they reject King James Onlyism, and you look at every single new version user, none of them, none of them will stand for one version exclusively. Not one. Why? Because they've gotten to level eight in the insane chart here. God reveals truth from heaven to men in different ways. So nobody can claim to have absolute truth, you see. They can't stand the thought of some people going around saying, thus saith the Lord. That's the whole issue. Back when I was lost, when I was using new versions, okay, don't even talk to me about it. I understand the whole reasoning and the, the philosophy behind saying there is no perfect standard. Because you hit something in the Bible that you don't really like and you kind of go, well, um, you, know, you know, who can say for sure? Maybe, maybe it's a little bit different in the originals and we can go to the Greek and the Hebrew and we can try to work our way around, you know, kind of like a snake. We won't get into that. This leads you to number nine. Every, every man decides his own truth and chooses a Bible based on personal preferences. You know, if you're the scholar type, you can go with the Greek and you can 
debate Greek words in the Nestles and Greek words in the Textus Receptus. Or you can get the uh, whole Textus Receptus, the Greek and the Hebrew. There's your Greek Textus Receptus, and there's your Masoretic Hebrew. Um, you can prefer the message for more of a modern, updated, uh, easy to read, you know, thing. Or you can go with, uh, see here, well, I'll show you this one, the New King James Version put out by Thomas Nelson, the uh, John MacArthur Study Bible. See, this is another part of the whole thing. When you reject absolute truth, you look for other people that do the same thing, and then you say that they're a great authority in the church. You seek uh, for teachers having itching ears, you know. I'm sure that that doesn't apply to you if you're a new versionist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have a whole bunch of them down here. I'm just looking. They're kind of all mixed up and around and things. Uh, or you can go to... Um, if you want to be ecumenical about it, you can get the uh, Catholic Youth Bible, New Revised Standard Version. I mean, there's all kinds of good stuff out there, you know, that you can use to uh, eliminate the authority, the perfect authority of the King James Bible. See? Number 10. When you go through all this whole thing, what do you end up with? Man is the standard, not the Bible. Read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and you'll see where that philosophy comes from. And that is what you believe. If you defend the new versions and this whole new version thing, that the Bible is constantly changing, it's never settled, it's, it's always has to be updated and updated and updated. And what they'll do is they'll say, yes, but the King James Bible went through different updatings and different changes and things like this. Yeah, but it stopped. So, do you have a 1611 or a 1769? Well, the 1769, but uh, I don't have a 2017 King James Bible. It's the same book for hundreds of years. And when you look at the uh, changes from 1611 to 1769, most of them were spelling. Why? The font changed. And English language itself was changing. English was still a very new language in the 17th century. So, again, but we it always goes back to this whole thing. Because you can get into the debates, you can get into arguments of this manuscript says this, and the oldest reading says that, and the Vaticanus this, and Sinaiticus that, and Alexandrinus, and all that stuff. But it goes back to authority. Do you have an authority? Do you have a final authority? And let me ask you this. If you're one of these new version people that believes this list right here. And of course you'll deny it and everything else. I know, I played the game for many, many years now since I've been in ministry. I know how they deny it and you talk to them and they believe everything on the list. But let me ask you this. If you're a new version defender out there, is it a sin for me to believe that this King James Bible is God's perfect word and to preach it that way to the lost? Am I in sin for doing that? I'm not even going to ask you for a chapter and verse to prove it because you don't have any authority other than yourself down here, you see. But let me ask you, just reason logically here for a minute. Is it a sin for me to preach this book and call this book God's Word and to believe that it's God's Word? Am I in sin for doing that? Or would I be better off holding up a Bible that I don't even believe is perfect and calling it God's Word? That's the issue. Do you have God's Word? Can you hold it in your hands? The man who wrote this one, this MacArthur Study Bible, he doesn't believe he has God's perfect Word. And yet he cons suckers in by the thousands to come and pay his salary. Standing up there preaching out of a book he doesn't even believe in. And will readily change it whenever he feels like it. Who's the heretic? You better think about that.